Welcome to In Pursuit. Everyone should be in pursuit of something. Join us in our discussions today with inspiring people who influence our lives and energize our understanding of what's possible. Stay in pursuit while we welcome our host, Robert Pascuzzi. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of In Pursuit. Well, today we have my good friend, an amazing, talented director and producer in the film industry, Keone Waxman. And uh, Matt, go ahead and tee up Keone for the listeners, if you would, please. Awesome, everybody. We got Keone Waxman today, and he is an amazing American filmmaker who was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. He's known for writing, directing, and producing action films, dark thrillers, and indie dramas, which he shoots all over the world for his company, Action House Pictures. Keone currently resides with his family in Santa Monica, California, and is actually work, working currently on The Ravine with Robert, which we'll get into in a little bit. All right. Keone, how are you, my friend? Very good. How about yourself? Hey, we're doing great. Doing great. Well, hey, we're going to we're going to jump right into this Keone. Um the podcast as you know is all about uh visiting with people that are in pursuit of something big in their life. And uh I know you're pursuing many great uh great things right now personally. Um can you share with our audience what is your igniting factor uh or your inspiration in working in the film industry year after year? What really gets you moving forward? You know, the, the thing about the film industry that people don't really, you know, they see the movies, they watch things on TV, they see all sorts of things. What people don't realize is that it's, it's like any business, you're you're kind of reinventing the wheel every single time you tell a story, every time, single time you take a, you know, you make a movie. Right. And for me, the whole, my whole inspiration is just to tell stories that people love and can inspire them. You know, you find the truth in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so it's always the struggle to say, okay, you know, I'm going to reinvent this moment, this wheel in order to tell this this you know this story again so to me what inspires me is to find out figure out what is the truth you want to tell what is the story you want to tell what do you want to reach people with and then you use that spark to make that wheel and then the momentum from that just picks up and it's pretty it's pretty awesome i love it yeah and you're and you're great at it um can you take our listeners back to how you got your start share with everyone how how'd you really get into the industry what was the uh you know the first step you know, for me, I started, I started, you know, as a kid, I would go, uh, you know, growing up in Hawaii, uh, I would, my dad would take me to go see movies in, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, he goes, he'd take me to see Samurai films. Actually. So my earliest memory is going to see, seeing a, waking up in a, in a movie theater, uh, you know, sleeping on my dad's shoulder and, and watching a Samurai fight. So that's always kind of been my, my, the, the genesis of where I come from. But then I went to film school. Um, it wasn't a big film school. It was, uh, in, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, Me too. beautiful place to go to school and beautiful, a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of great talent around at the time. So it, it sort of inspired me to kind of, again, tell stories. Most of the people I went to film school with in terms of the professors were documentary filmmakers, were, you know, beat filmmakers or avant-garde filmmakers. So there wasn't a huge narrative thread, um, which obviously is where everything goes if you're, you know, uh, these days, especially if you're making films. But so for me, I ended up being a cameraman. And I started working in the camera department and I started shooting for all of these avant-garde filmmakers and so forth. They were my professors. Mm -hmm. And from there, you naturally tumble into writing. And then for me, it just became a lot of just making films in, in Boulder. My first film I made in, in Denver. Um, and I just started, you know, essentially making pictures based upon all the inspirations from the, you know, from school, but writing stories. And I think the big thing is, is for me, it, it st always starts on the page, you know, whether you're going to write a book, a poem, a screenplay, you know, um, it starts on the page and you, right. you have to have that, you know, that, that drive to write it out and then see how, you know, which way do you, which way do you fulfill it? Which way do you turn it into something that's accessible for others? So, you know, I got my start in film school like everyone and I sort of uh, got my start, I guess, even earlier than that watching some of our films with my dad. That's so cool. Well, and I've seen your creativity <laughs> come to life, um, you know, working with you on the ravine in watching you do your thing mm -hmm. and, and your craft and you're so amazing at it. So, um, very neat. Sure. Yeah. Very cool watching you. Uh, this I, first time I'd been on a movie set, but you were, you were so awesome to work with. Um, Keone, can you share with our audience? What is, um, what's a big goal or what are you in pursuit of right now in your life? What comes to well, your mind? Well, in terms of, uh, what, if you want to really into film, what my big goal is, and, you know, this sort of relates to, you know, meeting you and Kelly and the ravine, it's that, you know, I do tell stories for a living and I tell stories for a living, not just for, um, 
you know, to make a living, but I tell stories because I have to, you know, it drives me. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you got to know me pretty well in the movies, you know, on the set. And it's, I, I just, I'm compelled to do it. But the one thing, and I think we actually spoke about this briefly months ago. Um, the one thing that drives me right now is that I'm trying to, I really want to make the story that I'm known for. And I don't, you know, I've made a lot of movies, I've made television, made, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but I haven't made the thing that I want. I feel confident to turn around and say, this is what I'm known for. And the ravine is hopefully that movie. And that story is hopefully that one that people turn around and say, you know what? I really love that movie. I love that story. I really want to know who, who was involved. So for me, what, you know, right, right now what's driving me is I really, um, I want to create the one thing that people know who, you know, my career, I guess, is from. And at the ravine is really that thing at the moment. Hey, that, well, that's so cool because it's, it's our thing too. So we're doing this together, as you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that works out. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been so patient with with me in particular, you know, cutting my teeth on, on our first movie together. But it's been an amazing experience. And for the listeners. It's all collaboration. Yes, yes, yes. So the listeners, uh, be ready for the ravine. It's coming soon. Um, I, for Keone, I've always been fascinated how Walt Disney used his imagination. Um, do you mm -hmm. reading his biography? It was so cool. Just you know, hearing how he envisioned you know this theme park when he was a kid, and and just everything that he did, and how it actually manifested in his life. Do you sometimes feel like a kid on the set yourself? I mean, is, is this something you is this something you spend time? <laughs> you know, developing in other words, or does this naturally come to you? Well, I think it's, I think it's both, right? I mean, like for me, I'm, and, and you guys know me pretty well. I'm, I'm pretty gleeful on the set. I look around and every day I look at, you know, I'm on set, whether it's, you know, I have, I have 20 minutes to get 20 shots or I have, you know, 20 days to get 20 shots. It, it, you know, you're, you're not, you're, you're always under pressure, but Hey, I, I love it. Right. And right. you know, when you, when you, when you're doing what you love, and you're realizing it with people you want to, and you're collaborating and so forth. Yeah, you, you're, you're pretty gleeful about it. In terms of, like, Disney, you know, what did they say? They're, they were Imagineers, you know? I mean, the idea of being able to sort of say, in my head I have this idea. Now, let me talk to people and collaborate with people who have other ideas, but let's try to, you know, bring it all to fruition. Isn't that what kids do? I mean, you sit in a sandbox right. and you say, okay, who has the cart? Who has the dinosaurs? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. let's make a river. Uh, it's the same thing, except that then, you know, we're, we're a little older. And so people tend to take it a little more serious than a kid in a sandbox. They shouldn't, but they do. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, it becomes what we do. And, and you know, so I think you can tell, I, I'm always very enthusiastic about it. I, and I'm also very enthusiastic um, when I don't like something. <laughs> but, right. but I think you have to be, because I think you have to decide what you want to do. And I think that's what Disney did. Is he said, I'm going to create a theme park. I'm going to create these characters. I'm going to create a world. I mean, the audacity to think that way, right? But now you think about it, you go, "Wow, that you know, that's that's pretty big thinking, pretty impressive." Well, you know, one of the things I was impressed uh, with you in observing you on the set of the ravine was just how you were so even killed and, and in control, no matter what was happening around you. And and I think of that Bob Proctor saying is that we have to mm -hmm. learn how to not react but respond. And yes, absolutely. I think that's so important because I'm sure you've, uh, I mean, it seemed like to Kelly and I that, you know, for the most part, the ravine, the, uh, the shooting, the ravine, we didn't really have any major uh, glitches. I mean, there were the little things, of course, that you expect, but how do you handle that on a set maybe in the past in different films that you've made where you're dealing with maybe a, a very difficult actor or something's come up. The producer maybe is demanding things that you don't agree with. How do you how do you handle that and stay in control? Um, it's funny you say that. I mean, yeah. the, 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 there's a saying in movies, right? Where they always say, "Well, fix it in post," right? Mm. Meaning, you know, shoot it, you know, shoot it, get it in the can, fix it later. Really, in movies, you fix it in prep. I mean, and that's that's a secret nobody really talks about. And prep is your preparation. So for me, I'm very confident on the set, confident enough to have fun because. I prep like crazy. And when I right. say I prep, I will have three or four options to how to get something done in my head for everything. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the fun for me. And again, that's like being the kid in the sandbox and you're like, okay, so today we're playing dinosaurs. So, you know, on this ridge you have that, on that ridge you have this, but you know, I want to have fun through all of it. So how do I not end up in a position where I can't play with everybody? So 
you apply that to making a film where you have it written, you have the business end of it, you have the scheduling, you have the locations, you have 150 plus people, you have actors who have very specific, you know, needs and desires and, and things to, you know, create and to add. And everything's organic. So what do you do? You make sure that you have an idea of what you need to do. You make sure you have an idea of what you want to do. And then you make sure you have like three or four ideas on how to get there. And once you have that on your head and you start shooting, just like you were saying with Bob Proctor, once you do that, you're, you know, you're, 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 I always, I always use the analogy growing up in Hawaii. I always use the analogy of surfing. You know, you don't swim away from the current. You go with the current and you catch a wave. And that wave is why you're in the water and the wave pushes you in the right direction. As long as you know where the waves are, you're okay. So I always approach it like just you'd have to have options in your head and then there's nothing that you can't problem solve. And there's, I mean, obviously things do come up. Um, then you fix it in post. <laughs> but, but, but for the most part, you try to fix it in press. Right. I, I think of, you know, prepping for when you were talking about having options and, and strategizing how things could go one way or the other so that you're ready. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking mm-hmm. about the scene, uh, the the shot that we had to shoot at the ravine up in St. Francisville and just all the different elements. I remember <laughs> meeting with, you know, the special effects and everybody that was involved in that. Oh, yeah. And we had that strategy meeting. And so I, I'm visualizing, as you're saying this, I'm, I have this picture running into my mind is exactly what you're talking about. But fortunately yeah. for us, and, it went and, off and, in the yeah, first yeah. Uh, first shot, right? We got it right on the first one. Yeah. And, and think about it, though. We had, we had uh, plans to shoot, you know, and just to uh, touch on it a little bit to clarify, you know, to sort of express it, it, it expound on a little bit. You know, we had plans to shoot two different cars going off the edge. We had plans to shoot the car at the bottom. We had plans to shoot with the cameras in the bottom, the cameras, the the cameras on a drone, this or that. And at the end of the day, you end up shooting what you can, but you also end up shooting exactly what you need because you had all those plans. We didn't have to activate all of them. And, you know, as you well know, when we sat there after the first day, you sit there and you go, so what do we not need to do tomorrow in order to make sure that tomorrow works, right? And mm-hmm. what you don't need to do tomorrow are all the cool stuff you pulled off today. Right. So, you know, it, it, yeah, you, you can't sit, you can't sit on, in the moment, you can't be saying, I'm not getting the things I need in the moment. In the moment, you have to be so happy with what you're getting that you're just thinking now about all the stuff you're going to get tomorrow. Right. <laughs> and, and I apply everything to film, but yeah, I mean, right. it's a pretty good, pretty good way to apply it to, to life too. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, the ravine was a, I think a new type of project outside your, your typical film that you had done in the past. Um, sure. Keone, how was that? How did working on that movie, the ravine maybe stretch or build your concept of, of directing any type of project? I mean, what did you, uh, I guess, discover about yourself through the process of, of the ravine? Well, a, a number of things, obviously, and a lot of it may, maybe maybe are things about you know that, are, that don't have anything to do with the movie, you know, things uh, about myself personally and this or that. But I'll tell you, the, one of the things in terms of um, you know movies that I've done and how and things that I discovered on the ravine, um, you know, in relation to that, you know, the, a lot of the movies I, I I do and I have done are action films, and the thing about action films is you're still telling telling the story. You're still making sure that people empathize with the lead character. You're still making sure there's an antagonist and there's a plot and there's a payoff and there's a setup and all the same things that you tell that are stories. Mm -hmm. But the thing about action films, it's all about the loud moment. If you think about it, if everybody goes through or watches an action movie looking for the loud moment, the ravine taught me that the the quiet moments are sometimes more powerful. Because if you look at our movie Mm -hmm. and you watch the emotion that goes through and some of the best scenes, and, and I won't, I won't spoil, you know, which scenes, but, you know, we talk about them a lot. Right. Some of the best scenes are the ones where there's a quiet moment. And I love that. And you start to trust that, and this is to answer your question, you start to trust that the quiet moments are maybe sometimes a little more powerful. Instead of blowing something up, maybe it's better to have some one person in a closet talking to themselves. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. And we're going to see that, that manifestation of that in, in the movie. Because we have many of those absolutely. scenes, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that's so good, Kenny. I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, let me go this direction. The effective director, or in other words, the director in my mind, you're the leader, right? You're the general. You you have a vision of where you're going to go, um, and you you need to bring people along with that vision. Yeah, obviously, it's not by accident. What is your routine or your schedule on set? 
that you go through. And as I know you're very disciplined, I saw that you have a routine right. and you're going to execute every day. Can you kind of tell the listeners a little bit about your, your routine on set? Well, uh, sure. I mean, my routine, and you know, I've, I've done this a long time and I've done television and film and this and that. So you end up feeling it's, it's a groundhog day. You know what I mean? And we're all very used to groundhog day now, but it's groundhog day is every day. You're like, okay, I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. Right. I'm back to where I started. And sometimes it really is groundhog day. Like you're, you come back and you're shooting the same scene over and over. But for me, again, uh, it starts in prep. I, I visualize, I pre the entire film. And, and, and as you know, we talked, you know, you saw on set, I'll um, also shot list the entire film. And, you know, I'll do it myself. And I carry a shot list with me and I put it onto the, onto the sides, which are the scenes you're shooting for the day for everyone to see. And I kind of look at that as our dance card. So if anybody wants to know what we're doing today, look at the shot list. Now, it doesn't mean you stick to the shot list, but it mm -hmm. means that that's how, you know, that's, that's the list that you're going to do. I work off of that. And with the actors, with, uh, you know, my DP, with my AD, with the producers, with whoever you're talking to, right? Everybody should be working off that same thing. So it's almost like, and, you know, uh, to keep jumping around with different metaphors, um, you know, it's like you're, 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 you, you prepare for a football game and you know who you're playing against. And so you have, you know, your plays and you have all the plays that you think are going to work, but you call audibles, you change things up as the day unfolds. So for me, how, you know, how I prepare and then how uh, I, I approach the day is I come very prepared. I have my shot list, which is my dance card or my playbook. And then I just work with the people and find it organically. Then I look for where the waves are. And, you know, you it's very easy to find the enthusiasm. It's very easy to find the momentum. It's hard to stick with it. And right. so for me, a lot of it is if you're into it, if, you know, uh, the lead actor's into it, if the cameraman's into it, if the guy holding the boom is into it, you go in that direction a little bit. You, you're not influenced right. by it, but you certainly have to have your eyes open to it. And so that's my, you know, that's really how I approach every day. And, and again, I love it. I, I see it as like, hey, today I get to go to set and go to work. Every day. I, I've never once in the years I've done this been like, oh, God, I got to go to work today. <laughs> I know. I was so impressed always... with you, with your, with your stamina. <laughs> And you're, you're, you're <laughs> just, I mean, every day you're out there just rocking. And there were days where I'd wake up well, and I'm like, man, I'm kind of dragging today, you know, cause we're, sh I didn't realize the intensive nature of being on set 12 hour day plus day after day after day. Right. And, but I was it's so American. impressed with you, Keone, because every day you were, you showed up <laughs> and you were like ready to rock and roll. It's like, this guy's got unlimited en energy. And I was so impressed with that. Uh, hey, Matt, what's up? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you. Yeah, Keone, I remember it so being because that was one of my first feature films I was uh, working on, I would say. Uh -huh. um, and so I remember seeing you actually when you say you have this playbook, you literally had a playbook on your arm like a football quarterback. Oh, yeah. And I thought that yeah, was one, that was like the coolest <laughs> yeah. thing ever, you know, to see you really went in there with, hey, and just watching your focus, because I was watching you behind the monitors a lot, especially when I'm near my camera team, just uh -huh. wait, waiting to help out and to see that level right. of focus and even to see you just, you know, to be there and I can be behind you and you really care about other people's space on, on the set. So I really do appreciate oh, that. But yeah, that, that playbook, you know, you know it's, cool. it's cool. You said that. Yeah. Because I've seen you, you know, I saw you on set a lot and you know, we talked a lot on set, but one of the things that I noticed and in, in, in just to jump in what you were saying, one of the things I, uh, uh, to answer your question from earlier as well, is I never sit down on set. I have a chair that I put my stuff on. There's <laughs> no reason to sit on, if you're sitting on set, you're not being part of the set. Some directors will stand behind the camera and not behind the monitor. I prefer to look at the monitor because like shoot with two cameras at least. But again, you know, the idea is if you're sitting down, you're not participating. And if you're partic they're not participating, then how can you actually be part of it and feel it? So it's funny you say that because it's like, you know, again, if, it, if you're bringing on the monitors, that's great. Everybody come around and take a look. You know, I, I pay. So, you know, give me a little bit of pace. But otherwise, come, 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 take a look. Yeah, you never what we're doing. You never sat in your director's chair one time the entire movie. And I, <laughs> I saw that. I, I watched that the whole time. I think your backpack spent more time than, than you ever did in there. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's, where, that's where I put my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Keone, the law, the, I'm thinking of the law that says what you put out comes back to you. And I'm not sure if you, you're even mm -hmm. aware of it. But you leave. This is You, you impress me so much because you leave everyone you come in contact with, with an impression of increase. And as, as Bob Proctor, our mentor says, you don't get energy, you give it through the release of your sure. desire. And I just want to recognize you 
recognize you right now for that because you did such an amazing job. No matter who you were dealing with, you shared that energy every day with every person on set. It didn't matter who they were, whether it was our A-list actor or just the person carrying the camera, but you have an amazing way of doing that. I want to recognize uh, you right now for oh, that. I, so really thank appreciate, you. I, I really appreciate you saying that. You know, I mean, I, I, I look at it as we're all pretty, we're all pretty stoked and all pretty lucky to be on set. So, you know, the energy that everybody brings is, is sort of communal. And if somebody has an idea, it, it's, you know, it could be the best idea in the world. <laughs> you know, just, right. because, just because I didn't come up with it doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. In fact, it's usually the better idea. So I, I love what you're saying because it really is. I mean, everybody has a very important, uh, important aspect to give, not just on a film set, but, you know, anyway. So, you know, you, you, you know, listening is, is a, is a, is a big part of it. Right. And I just want to also recognize, uh, this, the crew that you, you guys brought, um, O'Sullivan mm -hmm. and Nathan and everybody that you guys brought this, everybody works right. so well together on your team. How long have you worked with those guys? I know there's a couple key players that you like to work with on films. And how did you develop mm -hmm. those relationships? Can you tell us how far back that goes? Um, for the most part, it's about a 10, maybe 15 year span. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who, you know, who I ended up not working with again. And, you know, what happens is, you know, you realize when you can, on a film set, you realize life's too short. If there's someone who, who is not, you know, as you're saying, putting out the energy and there's someone who is, not being positive about something, you know, life's too short, especially on a set, because again, we're, we're so privileged to be doing it. Right. And when I say privilege, I, I, you know, I don't mean lucky. I just mean, it's like, it's a very cool thing to, to, you know, to get into because we all know it's not easy, but in terms of, you know, Brian O'Sullivan or Nathan Wilson or, you know, Ben Day, all these people who I work with a lot, my editor, Trevor, you know, you also want to develop a team because you're only as good as your team. I mean, that's business. That's it. You know, you know right. these guys are your assistant you're coaches, as as, right? As, I mean, that's kind of yeah, how I see completely. it. You're the general, you're the head coach, Absolutely. and you've got all these moving parts, but these guys are your assistant coaches, and they're following out the game plan, the X's and O's, and if if you're not all on the same page, you're not going to have a good outcome. Yeah. And I and I really noticed how everybody, you were the you were the general, but you had everybody moving in, in sync. But a lot of that is already knowing what the other's thinking because you've worked so many times together, correct? Exactly. Exactly. Like Brian and I think very much the same. And you know, you know, Brian O'Sullivan. And right. where it's funny is, is that we're very different people. But when it comes down to how to problem solve, we plug in together very well. Uh, right. Nathan, the cameraman, the cinematographer, I trust his eyes. You know, how, and, and, you know, I can't shoot how he shoots. But when he says, you know, if I put it here, it'll look better, I, I'm not going to say don't. <laughs> right. You know, so there, there's, a, there's a certain amount of trust. And that comes from, you know, I've done, two seasons of television and Nathan and probably a dozen movies and Brian probably uh, no television, but a lot of movies with, you know, um, these are all guys who I know they know what they're doing. And, you know, when I shoot overseas, I have a crew that I work with all the time. Um, and a lot of it comes down in my editor, you know, you sit down and you talk to them about things and, and you know that they understand it. And, you know, the shorthand, like you said, with coaches is a big thing, but also the trust is a big thing that you know that, you know, I mean, let's face it, for the Chiefs, like, you know, the enemy is going to be great on offense, right? right. <laughs> um, you just you just know it. <laughs> so you just let them do his thing. Yeah, and they do it so well. It was just such a pleasure to, yeah, to work with your team. Um, I want to go I want to go and ask you this question here. We, we talked about, and I know you hold to your vision to try to get the perfect shot. I saw that time and time again on the side of the ravine. And that takes mm -hmm. focus. It takes will to stay concentrated mm -hmm. and stay focused on one outcome. And we also talked about creating a piece of art with the ravine, a film for the purpose of, of impacting people around the globe. Do you look at these pieces of art, ravine, everything else that you've done? Do you look at each film as a part of your legacy? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I really do. And, you know, uh, I, I, I think that, you know, your film is, film is art, right? Art, art is culture. And people look back and they and they see milestones in in civilizations and eras and decades and years based upon culture. Mm -hmm. And for me, I look at these movies and, and it's really a big part of who I am at the moment. Things change, but you know, you also like you're you're the first. Uh, you know, when you're on a film set, you're the first audience. 
And so if you are going, this is really cool, then okay, maybe other people won't think it's cool. But if you're true to that and you said, but I, every time I make a movie, if I think it's cool, I'm going to put in that people start getting a, a, you know, a sense of what you like. And so as a leg, as your legacy, sure, it, it becomes something that you want people to look back at and say, this is, you know, these are the movies that, that, you know, this person makes and I like his or her taste. I like his or her, you know, movie. And again, it, then it becomes something of whether or not people will flash back on it as something from 10 years ago, a year ago, a cultural milestone, or just, you know, something I saw on Netflix last night and fell asleep. <laughs> right. Well, it's, to me, it's something that, you know, not only that it, it, it's something you become proud of because you put so much of yourself into to get it done, but also knowing mm-hmm. that your kids and your kids' kids, and it'll be a generational thing, you know, for forever. Um, and that's really cool to me yeah. because there's so many things that don't last. So this is something yeah. that, that can just, you know, go on impacting people forever. Um, so that's sure. really cool. And this goes back to the very first question. Yeah, the, your very first question in terms of, you know, uh, you know, what's my inspiration? Of it? I, I, I'm constantly looking for the thing that I want people to go, oh, you did that. Right. Or, or even better, I like that, you know, and maybe they don't even know that I had something to do with it, but it's, it's always great for people say, oh, I like that film. And you go, yeah, I, 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 I made that, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic feeling because that's also like somebody sits at a dinner table and they eat a meal and they go, this is great. You go, yeah, mom, come on here. You know, <laughs> right. they, they like your food. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, that, those are, those are the movements. Those are the moments, right? Uh, that's, that's what we're going to remember. Yeah, absolutely. It's the moments. Yeah. Um, Matt, you had a question for Keone. Yeah, Keone. I mean, so I actually also went to see you Boulder. I think we talked about that the very last night on the wrap, which was a great (laughs) evening, such a fun 5 a.m. wrap going back and seeing the sunset. That was quite a magical experience wrapping the film up. But I want you to give some good advice or what would be some uh, something you would recommend to people, you know, coming out of college, you know, those people that being in film school, you just really don't know where to start. And I think you have to go out by doing but I'm curious on your take on yeah. what, on your approach, maybe how you approached after, uh, after you graduated um, and like what, what kind of uh, routines or methods you went through to kind of get where you are today? Well, you know, I, I, my, I, I gave you a little bit about my, my background on it. And for me, the, the thing that I just did nonstop is like, you just keep writing because the script is, is the currency in Hollywood, right? I mean, even if you have a, uh, uh, reality show, this or that, the idea, the script, what's on the page, that's what people, you know, that's what people look at, you know, execution of it is, you know, who, who's shooting it, who the director is, who the producer is, where you're shooting it, that type of stuff. But the idea of it is the page. So for me, if you're coming out of film school, I would say, write. If you don't write, then shoot, right? And, you know, never, if somebody doesn't like it, okay, somebody will like it. Make sure you, make sure you are your biggest fan make sure what you're making is something that you would want to see. You know, the, the other thing that, you know, it took me about 10 years before I actually heard it and longer before I actually realized what it meant is own your no. When you come out of film school, be able to say no. If somebody says, hey, come and do this, and you don't want it because that's not what you do, right. you can say no, it's okay. Because it's very scary when you're freelance, when you're like, okay, I'm going to, Tell people that I'm going to, you know, make moving pictures for a living or I'm going to write something or, you know, Disney, I'm going to make a theme park. Right. <laughs> you know, people are going to say, people are going to say, well, don't do that. Go and do this. You right. have to be able to say, no, That's I'm not going to work. Well, yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to make, make yeah. that happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to be able to say, no, 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 I'm good with that. So, you know, coming out of, you know, coming out of film school, I would say that in terms of what's the most daunting thing, your second film, make your first film. <laughs> And then know that your second film is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. After that, it, it's not, you know, it doesn't get easy, but after that, you know, you can make any. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good because, you know, it's, it's like anything. I think when you put yourself out there, you're remembered for the last thing that you do uh, until you do yeah. the next thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's yeah. so exactly. important to be, exactly. to be That's really, so yeah, be committed <laughs> and believe in the project, right. No matter whether you're making a film yeah. or, piece of art or whatever it is. It's got to be something that you can yeah. put your heart and soul into. I think we found that mm-hmm. on the set of the ravine. Um, I just want to mention, obviously I'm biased and, and, and whatnot, but I felt that genuinely most of the people, if not all the people we attracted from the actors 
to everybody on the set wanted to be there and they felt some at, at some level they felt a connection to the movie and to the story did you feel mm -hmm. that way as well I absolutely did, and I've been on a lot of sets, and I've been on a lot of in, in a lot of projects where that's not the case. But I do have to say, and this is, this circles back, is I have to say, I think that it all starts from the initial idea and the initial impulse of why, and that comes from you and Kelly, because from the book to everybody meeting you for the first time to us going down and scouting for the first time, there's right. an inspiration that you can draw from just the the pure uh, people could feel and the crew and the actors and you know even people we talk to who are just saying hey yeah you can rent our piece of land and drive a car off the edge right, right. they felt the inspiration behind what you and kelly were doing mm -hmm. um you know i saw my job was just to make sure that they had as much access to that as possible but you and kelly bring it so strongly and so passionately and you know uh, and, and it's such an accessible it's such an accessible um emotion you know, is that I think that the ravine is very unique in that fashion. And I think it's on the screen. Mm -hmm. You know, I think from even in post now, when we're talking with, you know, from our music to this, or that, I think we're, people are being attracted to, you know, to the film because what you see is how we felt and how we all felt when we shot it is what you and Kelly brought. Right. So, so well said. Matt, Matt's chomping at the bit again. One last uh, question. Yeah, from, my from last Matt. question was especially um, <laughs> when choosing a, wh what city you're going to film in because I just learned a lot about tax incentives and why people film in certain places. Sure. So what what do you look for when choosing your place to shoot? Is it more about, um, yeah, just go, maybe go into that. What's What determine, What are your factors that usually determine where you like to shoot a film? Well, are you talking about a location? Like, like, like uh, in terms of like a, a more of like a or, city. Like, for example, the like Ravine would, in New Orleans. Yeah, like why would you go New Orleans versus, versus right. New York City versus, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, and all, you know, all of that really depends upon the story, right? If the story has to do with something very specific, you know, New York is hard to say, well, I'm going to shoot somewhere else, right? Um, our story for the Ravine happened to be a story that, you know, I think um, was uh, enhanced, amplified because of the location. Now, obviously, people choose, you know, uh, I, places to shoot are in contention or in consideration, excuse me, because, you know, of tax incentives and this or that. But creatively, I look at it as, you know, we used to shoot a lot in Vancouver. Well, everybody shoots in Vancouver, but hardly anybody shoots it for Vancouver. You've seen every movie and every TV show spread all over the state shot in Vancouver. Right, but mm -hmm. people rarely shoot Vancouver for Vancouver, and it's the most beautiful city like two months out of the year. Um, right, but you know, so uh, I, I think that I think that for me, you know, looking at it, it has a lot to do with you know the story, the character, and all of that, and then you really see if that's the better place to shoot it. You sometimes end up shooting in places that you don't um, think is uh, giving is you know uh, amplifying the story as much as possible, but that's the best place you can. Um, you know, I don't see that as a deficit, but uh, for what we did in the ravine from, you know, what we do in a lot of uh, the acting films, uh, the location becomes part of the character. And so you really try to choose that. And then when you get on set on, you know, the actual location, then it's really about, you know, trying to figure out the best way to tell the story in one shot. You know, what, mm -hmm. what, you know, what about the bayou or what about, you know, this person's compound or, you know, the, the, this ravine says more about the moment than that ravine. Um, and so, you know, you go macro to micro, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, I think you, you end up trying to find, you know, you, you choosing your locations is like casting your film. You try to find all the best actors. You try to find all the best and the appropriate actors. You try to find the best place to shoot. Right. And you take, you take advantage of what, what the opportunity presents. It's like the ravine was, the book was set in Akron, Ohio, but we're shooting in new Orleans and we had to take sure. advantage of what new orleans brought right i mean just the history and the culture yeah. and the cinematography yeah, and we captured a lot yeah. of that and i see what you're saying we 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 wanted to make a film that showed the city and the culture right and that's that's what we did as a part of that yeah. film which was so cool right remember our first time we went down there it was okay so we, we you know let's look around so if we want to shoot it as a city great but if we want to shoot this city what 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 does it change things to? And everything you know, remember everything was like, wow, right. that's kind of cool. Okay, yeah, it's kind of better than what we were thinking here. And you really end up embracing it as a character. It just added to the beauty of the film overall. I mean, you know, there's not too many cities oh, in the world like New Orleans. So, absolutely. Well, Keone, 
you have been very gracious with your time. And wanna, Matt and I want to thank you for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much. Anytime. Again, we're talking with right, Keone thank Waxman. You, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, Keone Waxman, uh, writer, director, film producer, the man of the hour. And remember, folks, until the next show, always stay in pursuit. This has been another special edition of In Pursuit with your host, Robert Pascuzzi. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our program. And remember, everybody should be in pursuit of something.